you need to go back triage, right? And completely do an autopsy on the deal. What the fuck happened here? How did I do this? And it's, and it's not like it's like putting your nose in your failures. It's like, ah, oh, okay. The hindsight's 2020. I did this. I zigged. I should have zagged. He did, I, this is how I replayed it. So you actually learn from, from the mistake. Most people are just like, oh, that, that sucked. I don't want to look at that again. Let's just go forward. But you don't take the opportunity to find the nugget of value going through it because it's too, too hard. So everybody, let's give a warm welcome for Jeremy Delk. Let's rock, let's roll, let's go. Jeremy, good to see you, my friend. Thanks for having me, man. How's it going? Oh, man, if you cannot tell, I'm all jacked up on Mountain Dew, man. It's early. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's winning Wednesday, and uh, we're ready to rock the house, okay? We got a whole audience here looking to hear from you, looking to hear about this entrepreneurial journey that you've been on, because I know you got some insights. So my first question for you is, can you walk us through OK, your entrepreneurial journey from starting your early days, right, of trading. Right. I want to hear about that trading to building Delk Enterprises and what you got going on there. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so look, um, I'm a small town kid from, as you mentioned, you know, Bardstown, Kentucky. So it's, you know, uh, you know, bourbon capital of the world, Maker's Mark, Jim Beam, if anyone. Uh, I'm so, so a local supporter of that. But, you know, I, I grew up with this kind of yearning desire to kind of want to do more, be more and, and, and see more. And, you know, I think that, you know, was in silly I me. Mean, I lost just to kind of go way back. I, I lost my dad when I was like seven years old to a tragic bike accident. Oh, and, I'm sorry know. to hear that. No, nah, thank you. Um, like, like a motorcycle or motorcycle. Yeah, motorcycle. yeah, I ride, I ride a motorcycle and I went down too, man. Yeah. It's uh, it's tough. So, you know, I think that, that, you know, retrospectively with, you know, probably, you know, high, high, you know, six figures in therapy, kind of working out what drives and motivates you. Right. And I, and I learned a couple of things. One, you know, none of us are promised tomorrow. Um, and I think that was always this, this drive, but I, when you're a young kid, you don't, you can't see stability, right? When everything's good, you got a mom, you got a dad, you got, you know, food and school, like you can't see stability, but what you can see and really be influenced by is instability, right? So at that, you know, seven year old kid that, you know, you know, young mother, you know, now single with, you know, two young kids, no job, you, you go from a nice house to a smaller house, to an apartment, to a shittier apartment. Right. So we had this three years before my mom remarried, um, of massive instability. So I think that was probably the driving force for me of, I saw what lack of resources can do. So I think I never wanted that to happen to me. I want to be able to make sure I was taken care of. My family was always taken care of. So I think that was, that's what motivated me growing up in, in small town America. It was this wanting, you know, big fish, small pond type of mentality. And I wanted to, you know, like Sinatra said, man, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. It's talking about New York. So that's where I wanted to go. Um, well, hold on, hold on. I want to, I want to rewind just a little bit. Let's dig into this. Let's dig into this. So sounds like you had some shifts going on early on in your life when you were a kid. Right. And I, I kind of had some of that, too. I went from extreme poverty uh, with my mom and then I didn't really know any different, to be honest with you. Um, it, you just listen, I was getting in a lot of trouble and, you know, running the streets, you know what I'm saying? And got to do whatever I wanted to do. And uh, honestly, I enjoyed some of those times because it was crazy and fun and whatever. Right. But I got in a lot of trouble and then I was forced to move in with my father and he had the uh, stability and the structure and, you know, he wasn't rich, but he was not, but we were definitely weren't in poverty. Right. So then I could, I, I relate to what you're saying because I could notice that difference. Right. I didn't notice it when I was in the poverty, but I didn't know any different. Right. But then when that shift happened, so what, what happened with you and, and talk to me about that. You said you moved around a lot and, and, you know, you kind of noticed some differences. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think just see, seeing that, that level of instability, which is like your mom's crying, you're upset, you you don't feel safe, right? You, you're, you're the neighborhoods, you're moving like this, this, it's hard to pin them when you're a seven, eight year old, nine year old kid, but you feel it. Right. And then I think it was that retrospectively, you know, this later on in life that you kind of look back and that was the, that, that determining factor. Right. And I think that's what, you know, and my dad was, you know, Entrepreneur, he had you know, auto um, auto repair shops and what would work for himself, but we never you know, went without any money. 
And, you know, I think that was, you know, ingrained in me very early subconsciously, right? I didn't know I wanted to go make money. I just like, that was a subconscious thing that was ingrained in me. So marry that up to, Hey, 10 years old, we moved to a, a smaller town. So that was in Louisville, Kentucky, which is a bigger city where Derby is and all that to a smaller town, Bardstown. It was a relatively benign, normal upbringing, right? Both my parents worked for the post office, safe, you know, environments, but I just didn't like that, right? I wanted more. I really, I did feel like I, I belong somewhere bigger. So did you so, do any kind of like entrepreneurial like things as a kid? Like, did you sell candy bars or anything out your backpack or do, do nah, anything crazy like that? Like, cause I did a lot, bunch of little hustles, not, man. I had a bunch not, of little Not when hustles. I was a kid, but like, I, I think it was like, um, I was 15. And I was almost 16 because I didn't, I wasn't driving yet, but, um, I remember it's a good lesson to learn. Uh, do you remember how old are you? I'm 36. All right. So you may not remember this. I'm, I'm 43, but they had these, you know, this is way before Dyson and shit, right? Where vacuum cleaners, you get them for 80 bucks, you know, at, at Walmart or wherever they had the ra rainbow vacuum cleaners and they were like 900 bucks. And the unique thing about these things were um, it had water in it, right? So like, it was, I don't know that it worked, but it was a, it was a fucking game. And and you sold these things door to door, and you made like one hundred fifty two hundred dollars rips on them, which is basically a bill a billion dollars, right? When you're sixteen, okay, I mean that it, it was it was real, real money, but but they they had this little sales training thing, right? So I think I, I already had a gift for gab and could talk, but they really taught me some really cool lessons at at that you know fifteen years old. Um, where you can go through and I was a kid play the game, but it was just really having that emotional connection, right? Which that's what sales is, right? Sales is an emotional experience. That's it. It's not like every, like you can, like, I got a bunch of cars, right? You know, a car is a utility until it's not right. You need to sell the feature and the, in the, in the emotional feeling. That's why you get a Ferrari, McLaren, like, that's why you get these other things not to get you fucking point A, point B, but it's for this experience. So I had to go through, how do you sex, how do you sex up a, a vacuum cleaner? So it's, you know, just going through like, you know, Trevor. I want to hear it. Let's know, hear it. I, I, I want to hear dude, how you me, sexy it up, man. Let's well, go. Well, well, listen, you know, like, so the whole idea is like, like, you know, your home is your sanctuary, Trevor. Right. So if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, you're going through and you're coming in and you got kids, you have kids, Trevor. I don't know. I don't have, you have, you have nieces. Have you, anytime you come through or even just like having, having people over, right. So the floor kind of, yeah, going through. Yeah. I, you know, you know, I, I was at, I was, I don't know if you believe this. I was at the mall the other day and I was walking out and I actually saw, believe it or not, someone actually clear their throat. They spit on the ground. So could you imagine like walking through that and then bringing that back into your rugs, into your carpet. Right. And then that, that, that those particles and that's, those are liquid particles, but dust particles kind of going through. That's what you walk on. Could you, could you imagine like your kids, nephews, nieces kind of going through and, and being even, even pets. So what we have with this vacuum, uh, the rainbow is this, you know, complete, I don't remember the filtration system, but the idea is that we use water to kind of go through and that's what catches it because most vacuums you ever hit that bag and the dust goes everywhere. You're kind of just, you know, you're, it's a never ending component where ours is trapping the dust in this water, almost shampooing while you're doing it revolutionary technology and, and never there. So this isn't a vacuum. This is, this is something for an investment for your, for your family, for, for your, your health. health. Can I go? Yeah, exactly. Well, could so you like imagine you, how much you would have sold during the pandemic? Oh, uh, bro. Fuck it. Yeah. It put some, co yeah, put some COVID, uh, uh, COVID barriers on it. But, but yeah, but that, that, but that's the thing, right? So I learned and I thought, dude, this is so fucking dumb, but then you do it. Right. I think that's what you, then you do it and you're like, holy fuck. Even if they couldn't afford it, they wanted one. Like, like fucking, yeah, I don't want to have, like, who wants that? And if you go and talk towards those pain points, um, that's what people relate to. It's not the product or the service or even you. It's that relatability and that, and that connection. So I think that, that was my, my first little kind of hustle um, that I worked in hospitality and I ran front desk at a hotel and, and, and what have you. So, so yeah, I, I think I, I always had that little gift for gab. And then I learned uh, my, when my dad died, I only told the, the dad's were not to feel bad for me, but like I was going to inherit 30 grand and I took, and I, I was like, all right, it was in Disney and like a mutual fund. Like, fuck that. Like, that's not cool. So I was reading wall street journal and investment business daily. I was in raging bull, like forums, which like the Reddit back in the day before Reddit existed. And, you know, it was message boards and forums. And 
I was completely self-taught and this is in the, you know, late nineties. So the bull market was, you know, dot com era was booming, but, um, I was self-taught and I, I took that 30 grand and traded it up day trading up to about 2 million bucks uh, when I was 19. So wow. pretty cool. Yeah. It's everyone gets really impressed. How, with how old? Say, wait, wait, I, how old? Not 19. So you went 19. from 30 to two to two by age 19. Yeah. Dang. And, hold up. Let me get you a mic drop for that. Hold up. Let me yeah. get whoop, mic drop. <laughs> well, wow. Well, this, is the, this is the better one though. This what everyone gets impressed with that. What's even more impressive is I blew it all up in four days. Wait, um, wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait. So you put it on, you put it on black and then nah, spin the man, wheel. Like it, it, so you learn about, you know, not being with trades, but you learn about margin and leverage. And again, I'm a 19 year old kid that's self-taught. So I'm day trading on a Palm Pilot in, in college, making 30, 40 grand, you know, during an hour session. Like I couldn't be told anything, right? I was a genius, knew it all. But um, look, everyone's a genius in a bull market, right? I think look at NFT world, look at, you know, crypto, world. Like a lot of these things happen. Everything, it doesn't always go up. You've got to look at the indicators and, I had never experienced a down market. I always saw dips as opportunities to lever up. And then that's where you kind of made money long or short. So, you know, in that time, you know, I probably had four, three or four events in my life that were the big, you know, events that really shaped and put me, you know, on the trajectory where I am. And that was one of them. My dad was one losing that money at the time was the worst thing I've ever did in my life. It was just, you know, it was such a failure. Well, let's talk about that. Let's dive into that just a little bit, if you don't mind. So, cause you've experienced some highs and lows, right? So how did you navigate the setbacks and the failures? And then what did they teach you? What was the lesson that you learned from it? Well, so I think there was a couple of lessons. Number, number one um, is, I mean, I drank myself to, to bed like three days, four days straight. And I felt sorry for myself. And like, you know, you're, you're a victim, but like, I think this you, you, first thing you lost is you have a choice. Right. Um, and I firmly believe there's no such thing in life. That's a good or a bad thing, merely events. It's the emotions and the actions that you apply to those events that will ultimately determine if they are good or bad. So hold on. So you're saying it's the way you handle it, right? So like, no, not, not, not you handle it, but just like what, 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 how, how you feel like, okay. Oh my God, I lost my, so you had two paths. I, I could have, my story could have been, and it would have been a fine story. Young kid goes to school in Rhode Island, day trades, makes a couple million bucks, loses it, takes a shot, comes back and is a germ manager at some fucking factory somewhere that's not a bad story. Like, Hey, he took a shot, very successful young age. So he's cultured knows, and like, he's he got some experience, but that wasn't going to be my story. Like I, I was, I was so ashamed because not because I lost a 2 million because it was, I lost the money that my dad left for me. Right. And, and when I, I said, thankfully my parents worked work for the post office, my mom would give me the shirt off her back, but that's it. That's all she could give me. So I had the other component because I, at my freshman year, like every freshman in college, I went out and bought a, 20 foot ceiling, marble fireplace, condo, townhouse. I mean, oh, I was you were balling, a big balling, right? man. You was I was, a big balling. I, 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 yeah, but I still had a mortgage at 10% with option one. I, I had some stuff, right? So I had to go through. So it was either go home on my couch or figure the shit out. Yeah. What'd you do with your assets? Like, I mean, the, the things that you did have, cause you were balling out of control. sounds like. So what did you, did you liquidate all that stuff? No, nah, man, they shifted to liabilities and I could either sell them and lose them or fucking figure out a way to, to keep it. So, and still I was the first really one in my, in my family to go to college. So me leaving college was a fucking non-starter. You think two million is bad? My mom would fucking murder me, bro. So like that wasn't happening. So I still had to fucking finish school and figure out like 30 year old responsibilities, fucking paying condo association fees, fucking mortgages, this shit at 19. So around a full-time school schedule. So I was, you know, selling flip-flops and uh, polo uh, shirts at fucking Abercrombie, uh, mainly for the discount. I, I was stacking boxes and packing UPS trucks. I lasted two weeks in that job um, at night, cause, but they paid for your school. Um, I started doing uh, landscaping, you know, all this other shit just to try to go through, which I was no good at. And then besides my um, townhouse community where I lived, um, there was a, a luxury apartment complex and I got a job there, um, 
renting apartments. So like you would come in, Trevor, I, I'd send you up with a two bedroom, go through, I would get $500 commission when you signed a lease. Then we would have these events I'd put on like at the pool, like mingles and shit. And it was mainly like, Hey Trevor, you like it here? How's it going? Do you have any friends? You, anybody want to move it? Isn't this a cool spot? And then that was basically the lead gen for me to kind of go through. In one of those meetings, um, there was a guy that was a, a an equity traders manager um, at Fidelity Investments that was in temporary housing. He'd relocated in the Boston office. And we started talking about the market. And I was trading Qualcomm, JDS, Uniphase. So I blew it up, but I, I still had this sense of the market really well. And he's like, dude, who the fuck are you, man? And so I told him my story and he's floored. He's like, dude, would you ever consider a career in wall street. I'm like, yeah, man, it'd be my dream, but I'm just a fucking 19 year old hit kid from nowhere Seville with no college degree. And, uh, you know, six months later through background checks and several interview process, whatever, I ended up getting a job and became the youngest institutional equity trader at Fidelity investments in history. Right. I mean, you can't beat me much cause I was 19 when I got licensed. So you gotta be 18 to be licensed with the sec. So to answer your question, what did I learn? I learned so many lessons there. One, you're not invincible. The, the time you think you have it all figured out, just wake is fucking that right hook's coming and knock you the fuck down. Two. Uh, that you know, reminds me of, uh, what is it? Um, Tyson says everybody's got a, yeah, a plan until they get plan in the face. Exactly. hundred yeah. percent. Then, you know, um, the good times and the bad, none of it's permanent, man. We've all had fucking huge, huge wins, huge losses. But like, once you realize it's not defining you and it's not permanent, you're, 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 you're okay. But the biggest piece is like, you know, you don't have it. I wrote a book. Um, uh, it was called Without a Plan. Forbes uh, ranked it one of the top three business books of this year. And that's how I live my life. And it's a it's a bi biography, memoir, and business tips on it. But it's literally the last 20 years of my life with Dell Enterprises, my venture capital fund, is, you know, just go forward. Just get started. Because I there was no path that was going to take me from Nowheresville, Kentucky, building and blowing up two million bucks to wall street the way I did it. Right. There, there was no path. It was just me going forward, taking action and kind of going through and then letting these things and seeing the opportunities take them. It's not life's not all lollipops, gumdrops, fucking vision boards, fucking, I, I'm not stouting that, but you got to apply action to the fucking shit too. Right. You got to fucking, you got to be prepared to be lucky. You got to put the work in to be like, like that's, that's the, a, a key fundamental post that everyone fucking don't always have it figured out. Right. You know, show me someone in the clubhouse room, Right now, how many people I don't know if we have on 10 grand, put your shit in the chat right now, but I need proof $10,000. I'll give you right now. If you can show me a business plan from January, 2020, right. That modeled for a global pandemic. No motherfucker had it or go ahead. Show it to me. $10,000 is coming to you. So a screenshot of your business plan. The reality is you can't predict for that. You can't, you can't, you can't predict and model for everything. So why bother? Hold on. You know who had that business plan? <laughs> China. Yeah, China had that <laughs> business plan for sure. Um, no, what's his name? Uh, oh, my gosh. Why am I drawing a blank? The rich dude. You know who I'm talking about. Uh, ah, I can't remember. Bill Gates. Bill Gates had that planned out. Yeah, he knew that was coming. He was, he was preparing for that. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, that's the – that, that, that's the piece is like, you know, just go forward, you know, set a direction on the horizon and then – um, go. So a lot of lessons in there. And I think, you know, life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. And you, you, it took me a long time. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not some fucking, Oh, I lost it. I'm going to be fine. I was fucked, bro. I was fucked for years. But when I got out of it and, and then went to wall street, had a very short, but successful career on wall street, that L and the recovery is what gave me the balls to go out and start my own fund at 21 years old, because I saw myself dying in corporate America. Fidelity Investments, massive entity. I mean, they're a global, global multinational. I could have been rich and safe. I was already, I was making more money than both my parents combined, living in New York City, fucking slaying, right? Girls, party, everything. So I could, I could have done that, but then, the, oh, well, let me just wait till next year, wait till next year. Then you start dying in that little bit. The creativity starts going away. Just keep your head down. Then you got a wife. 2.3 kids, a fucking dog, a cat, and a fucking a llama, whatever you got. And it makes it harder. And then, and then you're sick. So it, for me, it's like, well, I go out on my own. I got, you know, my more, my, my rent of my apartments, five, six grand a month. Like it, it can't be worse than losing 2 million bucks in four fucking days. So fucking let's go. And that was a, a thing that happened for me. 
very early. I got lucky. Right? Well, like I want to talk about that real quick. Hold on, hold on. I want to I want to dive into that real quick, okay? Because it's something I was actually thinking about the other day, right? Anytime you're going through a setback or you're going through an obstacle, and it could be business, it could be relationships, it could be life, it doesn't matter. It could be your health, right? Any kind of setback or obstacle or moment in your life where you feel like you're just at the bottom, like you just hit rock bottom, okay? A lot of times it's easy to feel crushed, right? And go through all the emotions, which are totally natural and totally like human, okay? But here's what I want everybody to really take away is that when you're going through that moment, okay, you are not alone, okay? And when I say that, I mean that in three different ways. It means that somebody before you has gone through that exact same thing that you're going through, okay? So somebody in the past has gone through this, okay? Somebody's going through it right now, and there will be more people to go through it in the future, okay? So you are not alone. So what that means is you have people that you can lean on who have been through it, who can help you get through it easier. So that that helps your present uh, state of mind, right, where you're at currently. But if you can learn to apply or create a process or a system or even a product even, think about that. If you're able to create something, you know, document the process and the journey of whatever you're going through and create some kind of system process or product that can help the future to go through it either easier or maybe even completely solve the problem, okay? Well, that could be your biggest comeback, okay? That could be your setup. That could be your launch pad, right? But if you sit in it and you go, oh, woe is me, you're never going to find that blueprint, that thing that's going to help the future, the people that are going through it in the future, okay? Yep. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, I talk about this all the time, and even in the book, is like, you know, you don't learn from the wins. The wins are fucking, oh, yeah, I'm the fucking best, whatever. You, you learn from the, from, the, from the failures. The, the, the title of my book is Without a Plan, a memoir of, of unbound action, right, which is crucial, and failing my way to success. Like, that's it. And people are fucking so scared of failure because they are so – and not because of them. They're scared of what everyone's going to think. Here's like fucking boiler pit number one. No one fucking cares about you. They don't fucking care. They care about them fucking selves, right? So like Trevor, cool. We like, you don't give a fuck about me. We can help, whatever, but like we don't affect, we, we think like, oh, if I do this, everyone is going to think about this. And every time I see them in dinner in six months, they, dude, they have their own problems. They've got your own stuff. It's usually self-inflicted where we're, we're worried about failure. So we worry about so much. It usually prevents us from actually fucking going and getting started and doing something because of what someone else may think. But beyond that, when they fail, they're like, fuck that shit, man. That sucked. Humans don't like failure. Let's just mo move on and never look at that. And you've, lo you've lost everything then. You need to go back triage, right? And completely do an autopsy on the deal. What the fuck happened here? How did I do this? And it's, and it's not like it's like learning, you know, putting your nose in your failures. It's like, ah, okay. Because hindsight's 2020. I did this. I zigged. I should have zagged. He did, I, this is how I replayed it. So you actually learn from, from the mistake. Most people are just like, oh, that, that sucked. I don't want to look at that again. Let's just go forward. But you don't take the opportunity to find the nugget of value going through it because it's too, too hard. Oh, there's gold in there. I promise you there's so much gold in there. Some of my biggest transformational things within my organization and my business and stuff like that have happened from the, my biggest losses where like I had a client who, you know, went back on a deal or whatever. And I'm sitting here wrecking my blank brain going, how the hell did that happen? Like, where did we drop the ball? Like when I drop the ball, I want to go replay the tape and look at it and go, well, how did I, why did I drop that ball? You know, and, and do we need to secure it more? You know, like, what do we need to do to make sure we're not fumbling the ball around? And so, yeah, man, I totally agree with what you're saying. Some of your biggest wins will come from some of your biggest losses for sure. So, okay. Um, tell me about, okay. So you were with, uh, with fidelity. Okay. Uh, like how long were you with fidelity? Three years. Three years. Okay. So you were with Fidelity. You were 19. Now all of a sudden you're the youngest, you know, guy there at Fidelity. Uh, how, first of all, how did it go? Okay. 
uh, what challenges did you face when you were there being the youngest guy in the world at Fidelity? Okay. Was it easy? Was it hard? Was it challenging? Or, um, you know, like, tell me about that experience. And then what did you do after that? Yeah, of course it was challenging and high demand, but I just loved the market and I loved so much about it. And now was instead of trading my own portfolio, I was doing you know big institutional block trades and seeing the market and really getting an insight. Um, and it was almost like looking at triaging and, and autopsy and deal like, fuck, I wish I knew half of this stuff, you know, before while I was doing my own money. Um, I probably would be a lot more successful this knowing what I know. Um, and had to learn at Fidelity. But, you know, so I'm from Kentucky. Uh, you're from Texas. You sound like you're from Texas. I don't sound like I'm from Kentucky. Why is that? Um, I I would have all these ideas. I would come up with, what about this strategy? What would this? And I, I thought first it was because I was young, but like that I could, I could just demonstrate that my ideas were better. Forget the age. The, the money is money. And then I would just kept getting shot down. So much so that I thought maybe they think I'm just a fucking hick that the way I'm speaking, I'm losing them. Right. So I actually became this chameleon I, and I transformed like, you know, my, you know, my, my, you know, inflection and how I speak to try to, and that even didn't work. So what, what started happening is that I'm driving a BMW X5, you know, 2001, 4.4 flat. I mean, money truck, the dude's, you know, 30 years, 40 years, my senior, he's got a Bentley and we weren't doing anything different. And I had all these ideas and I'm just natural. I love to learn this creativity. And I saw myself like, dude, this is where if I stay here, I'm going to die um, inside, not physically. I would, my, a lot of my buddies still there and they play golf four days a week and they've got a good life, but it's not my life. It's not what I wanted. And that was, uh, that was important for me. Um, so that's what gave me the the kind of pause to take a stamp and I went out and started Delk Enterprises. Um, and that was in 2001. I started it doing real estate development and then I left in 2002 uh, to do Delk Enterprises full time. And I made 6,000 whole dollars my, uh, my first year in business, which was one month's rent. So luckily I had some cash stacked up, but let's talk about that for a minute. I like this. Okay. Let's talk about it. Okay. Cause I know when I, made that um jump I, I came from the auto industry okay and i was at the top of my game there and then jumped into financial services and hit hit the bottom too my first year was really rough and i'm watching my bank account watching my bankroll you know go backwards okay because i wasn't making a whole lot of money and uh, i knew that i was going to go backwards to go forwards i knew that okay i'm getting into something new is i wasn't stupid or naive i knew i was going to go backwards to move forward I just didn't realize how much more backwards and how much harder I was working and all that kind of stuff. And I know the mental like crushing that that did to me. Like I, I know like there were some times where I was literally on the ground, like crying about it, like pounding the ground, pounding the ground. And, and like, I remember having a phone call with my dad, like, man, dad, did I make a huge mistake or what? You know, just it felt crushed. Okay. I thought I was thinking, am I going to have to sell my house? Am I going to do this? I'm going to do that. You know? So talk to me about some of those emotions that you had, right? You jumped ship. Okay. You were the youngest guy at Fidelity doing pretty good, pretty successful there. Now you jump ship. Are you thinking, man, did I make another big ass mistake? Did I screw up again? What were your thoughts? What was going through your head? If you didn't have the, the, the loss that I had at, at 17, um, I, I would have been that. And that's why I said that was one of the best lessons I had. Cause I, that, that was the piece where it gave me the, the balls to do it. And I didn't care. I was happier, man. Um, now I'm glad, I'm glad it worked out to be better than six grand a fucking year. Right. Cause I, I've got some expensive taste, but like, I was happier. I was happier that first year making six grand than I was 260 grand. Ooh, let's go. Hold up. No, that's for real. Uh, even though when I made the ship, uh, the, when I jumped ship, I will tell you, I had freedom, <clears throat> you know, in the auto industry, I was kind of like a caged lion. Okay. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm free and I'm out of the cage. Okay. And yeah, I wasn't eating very much cause I had to learn how to hunt. <laughs> okay. I had to learn how to, I'm a, I'm a lion. I had to, they were feeding me over there. You know what I'm saying? Over here, I had to learn how to hunt. Okay. So I wasn't eating as much. Okay. But I was still free. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, yeah, I was happier, even though, 
you know, th there was some doom and gloom because I'm thinking about the financial side of things and I'm like, ah, freaking out. But yeah, okay. So that makes sense. So you were happier. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Cause I, I was, I was making my own and we were creating my, my first business was after real estate was building materials. So saw, you know, something on a plan became reality. Nice. Okay. All right. So what advice would you give to somebody? Okay. Who maybe has a dream to build their own, you know, empire, whatever that may be. They have some kind of dream a seeds been planted into them to give them that, you know, that courage to jump ship from corporate America. What would you say to somebody like that? You've got to look at two sides of it, right? The reason you haven't done it is because of the things that you're telling yourself. What if it doesn't work? What if, you know, my wife gets upset? What if the kids go through it? If, if I fail, like what, all the things that you, you really worry about and you're in your, everyone's looking at that negative ledger. I'm telling you, I don't care if you're 20, 30, 50, 70, right? I don't care how old you are. That cost and that risk is dwarfed when you're a hundred setting in the fucking nursing home or wherever you are of what if I did do it, right? That that's the piece that you fucking know. Look at what if I did do it, right? What if I did make it? What if I like the things of like the, the shot that you didn't take that will fucking eat you up for the rest of your life, man. And I think that, yeah, the, the re regret of like, Hey, what, what could I be? I mean, I think the, the, you know, yeah, it, it, what you could have been, right? What you could have been, who you could have been, who you've been, and not about money. It's not all about money. I mean, it's, it's easy to say, like when you made a couple of bucks, like people say that and it seems disingenuous, but you, when you get to a certain level, you, you realize it ain't about the money. The money is good to help for planes and shit, fucking travel and, re and experiences that that's great utility. Um, you talked about grant earlier, right? Fucking, you know, what's he say? Like life's hard with money. It's impossible without it. So I'm not discounting it. But when you really kind of get to that point of like, what, what am I doing this for? What's the impact, right? That I'm trying to make, whether it's my family or community or whatever that is, you're, you're destined to do more than you, than you, than you give yourself, but you just have to get the fuck out of your own way to, to go and actually allow yourself to do it. Somebody said, um, and I don't know who, who, who said it. I can't remember where I heard it, but they said something about hell is when you die and you meet the best version of yourself of yourself yeah yeah right you you, you get to see who you could have been right and so you know all of that regret and all of that like oh shame for like dang i didn't take this or i didn't do that or i wasn't you know man you know i think about that sometimes like if you if, if you really take a moment and and i think everybody should do this if you're tuning in right now you're online with me you're in clubhouse you're on you know, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you're at. I just want you to think about your life and I want you to like kind of close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to think of that best version of yourself, the, the ultimate premier version of you. Like, what does that person look like? What is that person capable of? You know, and how do you become that? How do you become that best version, right? Does that person, you know, uh, like, I'll give you an example for myself. Like there's some, there's something I've been wanting to kick and I'm going to put it out here. Cause not a lot of people know there's something, there's, a, there's something I've been wanting to kick. I just want to get it out there. Okay. Like smoking, like the best version of me doesn't smoke. You know, I smoke at nighttime when I'm trying to relax. So I don't do it during the day and all that. Like I want to just kind of like calm down and like chillax before I go to bed, you know? So I smoke a couple cigarettes at night but the best version of myself doesn't do that you know what i mean so think about yourself what is the best version of you and what are some things you either got to get rid of right like yeah. remove from your life or what is it that you need to add to your life to become better and then write those things down and uh start working towards them um i think it's pretty important all right so i want to switch gears just a little bit here okay um Actually, before I do that, on everybody online that's tuning in right now, got a couple of things for you. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast, I got a few things for you. Uh, number one, if you're looking to get more clients, uh, if you are an entrepreneur, business owner, maybe you're even a job seeker and you're thinking about, hey, you know what? I need to get back to work. 
uh, then guess what? You need to optimize your LinkedIn profile, okay? You need to optimize like a landing page with calls to action that make those people that are looking at it, those eyeballs that are on your profile convert, okay? They're going to convert into an opportunity, into conversations, okay? The goal is to get the eyeballs into a conversation. Thanks for listening to the Who You Know Show podcast. My name is Trevor Houston, and if you've enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing wherever you listen and leave us a positive review to help us keep the mics on in the studio. Until next week, that's the show. It's all about who you know.